I've got to tell you that 11 years ago, I was working at a little company where my boss was a mouse, and some friends of mine, uh, Joe Eames and others, said, you know, we're putting on this little conference in Salt Lake. I'm like, Salt Lake? Who goes to Salt Lake for a conference? I'm like, would you like to come out here and talk about Angular style guide you wrote? People might want to hear about it. Uh, and I think it was 2013, and I've been coming back every year since, and I think it's the 11th year of NGConf, and it's better and better every year. It's great. The conversations here are awesome. I love coming back. Uh, I am trying to remember my first topic I spoke about at NGConf. I think it was Angular 1.4, and it was using local storage inside of the browser. Um, way back in the days and things we did, but it's a lot of fun. The topics change year after year. Uh, Angular changes, the people change, we get older. Um, we get a lot of different things, but it's a lot of fun to come here and talk to you all. And the best part of this is doing the conversations in the hallway. So I invite you afterwards to come find me and have a good conversation. One of the great things about today is I love developments. I absolutely love editors. I like coding. I like Angular, React, Svelte, Vue. I like Java, Python, C Sharp. I love all these languages. One thing I love the most, though, is actually the experience of writing code. I had this weird brain where I get 20 ideas at once and I've got to get them down in the editor as fast as I can because if I don't get them down fast, I lose them and they're gone forever. And that's what I love about great editors like VS Code or uh, WebStorm and JetBrains and some other tools and Vim because you can get them out quick. But when Copilot AI started coming out, I'm like, this is what I want AI for. I don't want it to generate an image for me. I don't want it to write my resume for me. I don't want that stuff. I want it to actually help me with the mundane coding tasks that I have, or those really hard ones where I forget the syntax. Like, tell me which RxJS operator I should use here. First, Copilot laughs at me, and then it says, yeah, here you go, this is the one you should use. And that's what I use it a lot for. And the great thing is this is changing constantly. I give this talk about, I don't know, 20, 30 times a year, and every time it evolves and it's getting faster and better. Uh, it's also live, so you might see some hiccups today. So bear with me, and we'll have some fun with that, too. My name is John Papa, and I work for Microsoft in developer relations, and I just love writing code. So we'll do it a lot together today. But first, just a couple things about Copilot and what this means. So I have a lot of friends who are uh, excellent coders, just like all of you, and sometimes they look at Copilot, and I ask them, what do you use it for? Like, well, I tried it for this thing, and it didn't work, so I stopped using it. Or I was typing and the hint that it gave me wasn't exactly what I want or it kind of gets in my way. I know what I want. And that's true. It happens to me too. But I want to show you and open the doors to some things that can be super helpful. Some easy problems that hopefully it can help solve and some more complex ones that maybe you never thought of before. And kind of give you a glimpse at what's coming in the future with GitHub Copilot. It's all about a new developer experience. It's not going to replace us. About four days ago, I was rewriting all of my workshops for Angular, because what do you do right before you give a workshop? You rewrite 35 demos, right? What could happen that's bad? Uh, and I was doing this, and I'm like, I'm going to hunker down, I'm going to put on Lord of the Rings in the background, nice 11-hour movie line, figure I'd be there with a bunch of chips and sodas and get it all done. And as I started going through refactoring all this code and updating everything, Copilot started learning. It started seeing what I was doing, and it started suggesting the code. And I finished all that in less than two hours, like an hour and 15 minutes. And I ended up refactoring like 200 files, a bunch of stuff in Angular, in the terminal, through Git commands, and inside the code itself, using Copilot. And something that normally takes me a 10-hour thing. Usually I get halfway through Return of the King and I'm good. So, give you a little glimpse of my lifestyle. The developer experience is better. AI will define how we work as developers. It's not replacing it, it's making us better. It's taking away the pains and making things easier. Uh, it's giving us better experiences, like we used to Google stuff and Stack Overflow it, and we'll still do that, but it's helping us in a lot of ways. So with this, we'll get a better experience overall, and it is our programmer partner. It's like having your personal Ward Bell be on the phone with you to help you understand how to write your subjects in RxJS. It really is a new developer experience to think about. And there's all these studies about what's actually happening with AI for developers. And actually getting out there and finding out what's helping the developers learn and grow. And the effect 
that Copilot's had because it is now the largest used AI tool out there in the software industry. It's been really, really impressive. So you're maximizing happiness and productivity, and these are all based on surveys, accelerating software development. A lot of enterprises are using this, and it is proven through these studies and through companies that have worked with us to show that it actually makes them more efficient and can get out releases better, less issues, and actually deliver better code more effectively. It is, of course, the first overall pick among developers to use this. There's 1.5 million developers using Copilot today through tools like WebStorm, Visual Studio, or Visual Studio Code. So you can use it there, also on the website. And it's really helping you get faster. Like, nobody really looks at this and goes, I don't want to use it because I don't want to be faster. Like, who says, I don't want to be coding faster? Unless you're getting paid by the hour. And these are some of the things that it helps you with. It's not just giving you answers. It's that mental effort for repetitive tasks. There's a lot of things we do every day that are very, very repetitive. And Copilot will help you do that. And it helps you stay more in the flow. So you're not trying to figure out, oh my gosh, I'm looking in that control flow with that new four syntax of Angular that I love. And I've got a track in it for a track by. And I stared at it for 20 minutes the other day, missing a semicolon. Copilot took me uh, and helped me fix that kind of stuff, but it allowed me to stay in that flow so I didn't have to forget all the other things I was working on. So little things like that to larger problems that I have. Like, I need a component that's going to have a yes, no, cancel, modal dialogue in Angular that only shows up in this one area of the screen and have Copilot generate that for me and have it actually pull together. A lot of things that it helps you do, like just give you an idea of things we'll look at today. You can design and brainstorm, collaborate. You can ask it, what the heck does this code do? Um, one time it actually wrote, you just wrote that code, John. You should know. I thought that was funny. Um, sometimes I wonder if there's actually somebody inside watching me. You know, collaborating, things like that. It also lets you do tests. So I'm not a big fan of writing tests. I like them, but it helps me do that. It helps you debug. You can correct syntax, do git commands. Um, I never remember the syntax for grep inside the terminal. You can actually use Copilot in the terminal as well to help search files. Super helpful, too. You can write documentation with it. In fact, I wrote the README for all my workshops using Copilot because I didn't want to write the markdown. So it actually generated the markdown for me for my README files. One word about security, too, though. Like, the way this works is your context of your code in Copilot is pulled out, whatever you send it, it's pulled out, and then it's sanitized. It removes personal identifiable information. It removes anything that's like a secret or other information before it actually sends it to the AI up in the Azure servers where GoPilot and GitHub live. It authenticates you. It also does stuff like abusive language checks. Uh, it's trying to really take into account responsible AI. AI is great, but without responsible AI, we're really going down the wrong road. Now, is it perfect? Absolutely not but there's a huge push on making sure that we actually have that in place. And then when it brings it back, there's also security filters to make sure that the code's bringing back is actually secure, that you're not running something and is making a suggestion that's gonna be a problem for you, to the best of you can see. It also does sentiment analysis. Uh, it'll also try to dedupe any of the answers that might be almost identical as well. So there's a lot of pieces in here about the security aspect. And I'll tell you this, it's very, very, uh, very much taken seriously at Microsoft and GitHub to make sure that Copilot is taking your security and your privacy uh, to that level. It is awesome. You can use it in all these editors today. I imagine more will come. So it's not just limited to VS Code, which is what I'll show, but it's also in these other editors, which is great. And it works with many of your favorite languages. Um, you can actually use it with Python. I'll show you some of that today, too. But now that we've kind of given a quick overview, let's dive into some code. All right, I have, I think I counted about 35 demos today. We can also count how many will break, because this is live over the internet to a cloud service with AI, which always goes perfectly. So let's say first we've got just a, a simple example like this here, and I'll show you several features of, of GitHub Copilot, and new ones are coming out every day. In this particular code, I've got a set of products. So in these products, in fact, I was just playing with it before we got here. So we'll reset. There we go. We're just getting a list of products. And these products are being returned back from a function. And this function could be a serverless function or something with Express uh, or on any server. And maybe I, what I want to do is I could sort these or do something different. 
very simply, all I need to do is once I install the extension and sign up for Copilot, is I can type in a comment and it gives me inline syntax. So a lot of times I just kind of think out loud of what do I want to do? I want to sort the products. Okay, but I went to a college recently. I do a lot of work with the universities, and I was asking them, I asked the professor, what's your favorite sorting routine? Is it a bubble sort or a quick sort or a binary sort or what is it? And they were kind of throwing them at me because they're all math majors and trying to do it. I said, okay, let's do that. Let's sort the products by name using, let's just say, a bubble sort. Go back to our college days, and boom, rips out a bunch of code that will take me a minute to actually process, you know, going through the different fors and, and lets, et cetera. But it rips that code out pretty quickly. It gives you some options here. And you might be like, you know what, that's nice, but I don't really want the bubble sort. Maybe what I want instead is a quick sort. A little bit easier, right? Following different syntax there. So it actually understands the context of the conversation. Uh, and maybe we could do other things in this too. Sort products by name. Uh, we can say using and that ray.sort method. So it actually give you IntelliSense hints. You can go to the next line and continue your conversation too, which is kind of nice. I could say using the fastest sorting routine in the Western, oops, Western world. And I can spell things wrong like this. Now let's see what happens there. It has no idea what a route in is, I think. I thought I could spell things wrong. Routine. It is confused. How do you know it's running? That's a good point. So in the bottom, there's a little icon. And on my screen, I can see it. I'm not sure if it's coming through, but I can actually see it blink sometimes when it's actually going through. Um, sometimes it does get stuck, as I said, because it is live. And we can run through and see what's happening. And yep, and what I usually do in that case is I come through and I just stop it. Oh, it's already got a sort routine. So that's actually what happened. It had a sort. It's like, dude, I already sorted for you. That's when it needs the little John, you're being stupid icon. You've already sorted this code, John, using a fast routine. And boom, there's another one. Now, let's say you didn't like that option. If I go back there, if I hit, I think it's Control Enter, you'll see a suggestions on the right hand side. And these suggestions are nice because it gives you multiple options. Uh, and then you can go through those suggestions and look at the code and see which one you want. Say, all right, well, there's one using local compare. Here's another with an A and B kind of local compare suggestion. Then there's a simple one. You can pick which one you want and apply it. So it'll give you multiple suggestions that you can actually go through, which is kind of nice uh, looking out there. Now, these are pretty simplistic uh, options here. And I'm sure most of us actually know how to use the sort routine. But let's take a look at some other things we can do too, like maybe we want to add other features, like add a property for out of stock and for date or dread. Let's see if it figures, knows what or red means. So it actually has a translator for John Papa's terrible typing, which is super nice. But it can actually add things to it as well. So there's all sorts of cool things you can do with Copilot. In fact, if I keep hitting enter, sometimes it'll get aggressive and start saying, hey, you know, here's more code that you can put in here too if you'd like to. Uh, to me, that's where sometimes it can get in the way a little bit. I just ignore them, hit escape, and it makes it go away uh, before it actually asks things that I don't want. But let's do some bigger generation. Let's say we're looking at a model class. Now I want to get like customers and orders and details. I can use the same kind of syntax here to say, uh, create a customer class model. And let's not even give it any properties. Oops, let's, let's give it a property. Uh, with some basic properties. Properties. Sure. Customer. And there we go. Name, email, print the customer name. Um, so you can kind of manipulate this around. You can even then uh, go up here and say, let's get rid of that and say, instead of that, with some, let's create a customer model class with a CTOR for instantiation. That's actually a word. Nope, don't want that. Nope. It's like, hey, we're not helping. Let's see. By the way, there's a better way to do it, but I want to start here, kind of show you that. And sometimes you just have to start over and say, hey, let's create a customer class model. And it's not going to happen, so we'll do it that way. Let's say, create a customer class Please, 
Why you no work? <laughs> really? <laughs> but I am live in front of 200 people laughing at me. <laughs> Clearly it's working? All right, fine, export the class for me and create customer. Oh, now it's gonna put them in comments? You are hurting my reputation. <laughs> Thank you for coming. That's it for today. AI wins. All right. So let's move on to the next one here. Sometimes it can get kind of cranky when it's doing this. Um, God, I love this thing. Anyway. So what I use it for a lot of times is just like fixing things up. Like I'm inside of a function, I've got get products, update products, et cetera. And I can use things here like, uh, let's say create a function that uh, searches the products um, by name. Let's do it by name. And boom, yeah, now it works, right? So now it's creating a search products in there for me and it gives me some code. Now you always have to look at this code and go, is this what I want? Is this not really what I need? Like don't always take it exactly as is. Uh, how many of you here literally go to Stack Overflow and copy and paste without reading anything? I do it. It me. The three of us can have a good talk later. Yeah. Um, we should not be doing that, right? <laughs> Definitely look at the code. Uh, so I love when people say, but John, it doesn't give me the perfect code every time. How can I trust it? Well, did you trust your Google search when you asked it to do something? Like just copy and paste? No. We still have to actually look at the code, make sure it's right. Like, I like that it gave me a Terminator trim up here, and it put the API down there, but maybe my, Terminator, um, my term is not actually gonna be passed into name. Maybe it's something else. So I can switch these things around if I want to. So there's cool things I can do inside of this. I can also ask it to uh, rename the function or filter it out and do other cool things. But it also can have some fun with some stuff. So let's say now that what I wanna do is I wanna go over to uh, an interceptor project that I have. And I've got this code here, and I'm trying to figure out what it does. Well, one thing I can do at the top say, explain what this code is doing. It hurts my head. It's adding a CRSF token to the headers of the request. Well, that's pretty cool. So now I can start asking questions like, okay, what is a CSRF token? It's a unique secret, unpredictable value generated by the server, transmitted, blah, 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 blah. Oh, that sounds terrible. Cross-site re cross request forgery. Um, is that bad? <laughs> yes, it's bad. Uh, on a scale of 1 to 10, how bad is it? It's a 10. So I can't ignore this? No, no. It's kind of like someone's looking at your shoulder like Big Brother as it's going through. But you can see how powerful it can be because it's giving you good information. You can actually tell to generate the comments for this code uh, to go down a little bit further. You could even do stuff like, you know, ask more about um, uh, has anyone ever been attacked by this? And notice I'm not telling it CSRF, but it knows. It knows. It's keeping the context of the conversation along the way. One of the cool things about Copilot is you don't have to constantly repeat yourself. It's got the context of what you're talking about. If it can't figure out what you're talking about, sometimes it'll prompt you and go, I'm not sure what the, this means. Can you please specify? Or other times it'll say, can you highlight the code for me? Because there's too much code for me to know exactly which one you're talking about. So all this gets pretty, pretty cool. Um, now, more important conversations, you can also ask it like the meaning of life and things like that. For example, one of my favorite conversations, if you see my Star Wars tattoos, is what is the best Star Wars, the Clone Wars episode? It's thinking. There we go. Season 5, episode 20, The Wrong Jedi. Oh, it's an emotional one. Uh, it seems like I'm going to watch it here. 
It's about Ahsoka Tano leaving the Jedi Order. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Um, who dies in Star Wars Empire Strikes Back? And notice that's a little bit controversial. I actually put die in there. So be curious to see kind of how it talks about this. In this case, it doesn't really worry too much about it. Um, by the way, does character die in that movie, Obi-Wan Kenobi? That's the wrong movie, man. Bad co-pilot. Bad co-pilot. Bad co-pilot. Obi-Wan does not die. My apologies, you're correct. He does not. But he dies in A New Hope. Like, wait, why don't you just say that in the first place? It's kind of like your drinking buddy who's just trying to trick you along the way. I love asking Star Wars questions. And meanwhile, my friends at GitHub back at work are like, you know, they're analyzing this going, why is this one guy always asking about Star Wars? You know, what is going on with this code? I'm not really sure. But you can do all sorts of cool stuff. Now, this isn't quite useful for the code, but it shows you some cool features. So far, I've only been showing you how you can use comments to do this in IntelliSense, which it's hard to miss this because anytime you type comments or code, Copilot's there to kind of talk to you. But there's other features that you can use. So let's go back into this CSRF. And actually, I'm just going to undo those changes, get rid of all that stuff that we had. There we go. And let's say I really wanted to know what this code was doing. I can highlight the code and hit Command-I. Command-I is going to give me a quick chat in line, zooming, zooming in there. And it has the context of whatever I'm either on or, zoomed or uh, selected. So now I can ask it questions like, explain this, what is this, uh, interceptor thing, please. And it's using this slash explain a general response and explaining what that interceptor does. Then I have some options here. Like I could actually ask it how to improve the code. Uh, make suggestions to improve this code. Let's see what it likes about my interceptor or not liking. So now it's using this slash fix. Slash explain and slash fix are commands. They're called slash commands that you can use to provide more context to Copilot. And obviously explaining and fixing are two very common things that you can do. Uh, let's see, rerun without it. Sometimes when I use a slash command, it gets very unhappy with me. All right, so it made some suggestions. Let's look at it. And I can accept them or discard them. I can also thumb up or down, which we actually look at to say, is it working well or not? And I can look at the change by clicking on this button right here. So it effectively did is got rid of this garbage comments that I had in my code, because I don't really need that. And then I can accept my code and take a look at it. It's actually did a pretty good job taking a look at what it did there. So you can use this inline chat to basically help you get your answers for the code. But what about another option we could have? So let's say we take the same code, and I did Command-I to get there. If I do Command-Shift-I, I get a bigger version of the same thing. So now what I can do, and you actually saw me running this before, I actually asked it to suggest a simple Angular service class that generates and creates an RxJS subject for emitting a message when someone logs in. And here, you can see a very simple service with some oddball spacing choices, where it actually creates a subject in the class to generate the login for me. And then it explains kind of what it's going to do. What's cool about this, if I go to Command-I, I get the inline. If I go to Command-Shift-I, I get a larger version of it. It gives me a little more context. And in either one of these, if I like what it's actually doing, I can click this upper button in the upper right-hand corner to open in chat view. And then the chat view is really the most powerful piece. It gives you all the context of your entire conversation. So you can ask it a series of questions, and it remembers those questions in context. It's caching that, so it knows what you're asking, and you can continue down that road. This way, you can actually ask it questions like, um, create me a class in Angular that uh, emits a message when I do a login. And it might suggest some class. Okay, you know, this is cool, but I want to use a behavior subject, not a regular subject and then it can rewrite it. And sometimes it'll drop things out of the code when it makes suggestions. You say, I like this, but please add back in the console logs, or please uh, add a function that actually does this or that to it. And it remains and keeps all the context as you go through. Let's take a look at some other examples that actually show you how to use the chat, because the chat's a super powerful feature. So let's go over to this other project again, and my product data. And this application has some products like strawberries, sliced breads, and apples. 
And what I could do, and there's more code in this beyond that, is I'm going to highlight this code, and then I'm going to hit, I think it's Command Shift, sorry, Command Control I to open the chat, or I can go up to the Command P and just type in Copilot View right there to go right to the chat view. And I don't really want it to remember what it was doing, so I'm going to do slash clear to kind of just clear the playing field for what's up there. Now, when I do this, I can type something in like, I want to have seven products. So what I really want to do is I want it to ask it to initialize the data.products. And uh, it's an array constant thing uh, with seven products. Please keep the three that are there. And notice these are all foods, hopefully healthy ones. So you can get a little tricky with this sometimes, too. Um, replace the existing code with the new array of seven products. And I'm getting kind of lengthy here. I'll tell you, one of the tips for writing a prompt is to be specific, brief, and ask it to do one thing. When you ask it to do a lot of things like I just did, sometimes it can go a little wacky. And when, I do, when it does do that, I kind of back up and tell one at a time what I want it to do. So let's see what it did this time. And I'll open this up a little bit more. So did it keep the three that I have? I had strawberry, sliced bread, and apples. It did. But it also added in almonds, spinach, chicken, chicken breast, OK, and quinoa. So it's adding all those things in there for me. It actually looks pretty darn good in the first try. I was hoping it would break so I could do something different. But we could take that. I could then highlight this code. And if I like it, what I can do is up in this corner, I can click on this button, insert a cursor, and I just replace my code. So now, to show that code, I can kind of see the array right there. And it's now updated, and I've got my seven different products. So it's really nice for, um, for generating code, for putting in new pieces. And it's not just for creating new code. You can actually modify existing code, which is super helpful. So Copilot Chat does a lot of this for us. It even does stuff like helping us understand how do we actually do um, RxJS syntax? For example, I could ask it down in this get products function. Maybe what I want to do is add in some RxJS retries. So now here, I'm going to go back to the quick chat briefly and say, uh, please suggest RxJS code for doing three retries of this call. I can use a retry operator. OK, let's see what happens. There's my get product, and there's a pipe for the retry of three times. So simple things like that can go into your code. And you can actually modify this uh, and do more as well. It actually noticed it actually put the import at the top, too, for retry. But you can actually put in a lot of RxJS suggestions. I actually use this a lot for RxJS, because so I, I never remember the darn operators' names. Um, another thing I'll do sometimes is I'll go over to the chat. And if you were in my workshop the other day, you know one of the failures I have is I never know the difference between merge map and smitch map and concat map and combine latest and fork join. I always have to look them up in my own notes. So you can actually ask it to say, hmm, uh, explain the difference between merge map and concat map for RxJS. And I'm going to try to spell concat map right. There we go. So now it's going to try to tell me a little bit of the information. And I'll zoom in a bit. So now it's giving me a little more information about this and the bullet points about what merge map actually does, and then shows me an example of using it, and the same thing for concat map, which is super helpful. And now maybe that was too much for you. If you're like me, you're like, that's a lot of words. Um, thank you. That is helpful. Always be nice, by the way, to your pair program partner. Can you? explain it even more succinctly. I even spelled succinctly wrong. Let's see. I can read that much better. <laughs> so my little brain can handle that, which is great. So you can actually ask it questions that normally you could go out for. And then you could even ask and say, you know what, if the code am I right, which one of these should I use based upon the code? Can you make a suggestion? So you can actually uh, give it the context of your code to go that far down. All right, but one of my favorite things in life, and I'm being sarcastic, is this. There's always somebody, by the way, who in this crowd likes this? Yeah, it's you. Yeah. 
You know, they have those um, self-help groups for people like that. You know, hi, my name is Sally, and, you know, I like regex. There's those people. You know what they say about regex? What do people say about regex? Let's just ask it. Some people say, I'm confronted with a problem, I think I'll use regular expressions. Now they have two problems. <laughs> By the way, that's exactly what I was thinking, which is really freaking me out right now, that it actually had that up there. Um, yeah, so regex can be a problem, but you know, when you first look at that code, just call it out. Does anybody know what those three lines are doing? Yes. 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 What are they doing? Uh, Something. Uh, yes. <laughs> phone number? Yep. Email? Date? Nope. Password. Yep. Um, they are, it's, it's, that's what those three things are. And they're actually kind of simplistic versions. Like we've all seen regex that were like 800 lines doing a password check. And I want to know who wrote that, by the way. Like somebody sat down like that. To me, that would be an 11-hour Lord of the Rings marathon. All right, so let's use the chat real quick to get there. So let's go ahead and clear again. And let's ask it some questions about these regex. So I like the briefly thing. So explain these regex briefly. Like I don't need it to give me a book on what these things are doing. Oh, so now it has no idea. It says the code expert excerpt is empty. So sometimes you have to highlight the code that you have. I hit the up arrow and I'm running it again after I selected the code. Now it knows what I'm looking at, which is helpful. So the first one is for validating email addresses. Great, and it kind of goes through that. Then there's the phone numbers. All right. Totally follow you. Gentleman up here actually knew what it did, so he didn't need that piece. But let's clear it off again. Now let's say that we want to go ahead and make it more readable. Make suggestions to make this code more readable. Uh, let's give it more stuff like and add better constant names. Like X, Y, and Z, I love them, but that's not really helpful. Okay, so now it's got you know, better variable names. That, um, and let's add more stuff. So by saying and, it's going to give it more, more information and add comments. So I know what this is doing. So it gives me more descriptive comments. Yeah, that was not helpful, by the way. I could tell that now by the variable name. That's more helpful, which is giving you like, what is it actually doing? And the one I really want here is uh, and add comments with a uh, valid and an invalid example for each and an invalid. Like when I do regex, I often like to show both inside my code so I can actually put it over there. Because when I'm looking at that password, I'm trying to figure out what exactly is a valid password in this case versus an invalid password. You know, the emails and the phone numbers I can kind of figure out, but now it's kind of giving me an idea of what those things might be. So I can bring that code over, but maybe I also want something like uh, add, we'll do and, and add validation functions and comments. So we've got those, but we also want like some test methods that we can use for that regex. So now I've got my regex with my examples and notice it's trying to bring across the different pieces we have. It did drop the examples for some of it, but now it's going ahead and giving me the functions in here. There we go, there's those examples. And then when I'm done, if I like what's happening here, I can go back up to the top and I can bring the code over. And now, while it's much longer, somebody might actually know what that code is doing without having to ask the gentleman over here who knew. So, much easier. Sorry, I put you out of a job with liking regex. Someone will help you. But I do like using this for regex. In fact, there's some other cool stuff you can do too, like explaining code. We've done that a few times in here. We've added comments to code. Uh, we can have it fix code. So, I think this code don't look at what I'm doing. This code has a bug in it, does it not? There's no red squiggly. What's going to happen? So let's say I've got some bad code here where I've got um, an, a problem. Zoom out just a sec. I'm going to highlight this code, and I'm going to go back to the chat and ask it to fix um, the problem in this code. And let's see what happens. Now, there's no actual error being uh, laid off here, 
But notice, it just said here, they think there's a typo. You're probably not looking for the word Jason. And then it blocked public codes. It was blocked. This does happen occasionally. And I thumb it down. And then I ask it again. Not quite sure why that was, uh, that was blocked, but we'll see. Sometimes when it's blocked, by the way, like simple keywords, because it's doing that sentiment analysis and other responsible AI, it'll see a word in there that's like, I'm not sure what's happening. And then you'll get this kind of a response where it kind of does that fade away thing. But it's nice actually detecting problems in the code, uh, even when you've got like little red squigglies inside your stuff. Uh, let's go ahead and take a look at some other stuff. For example, let's go back to this product data. And we had all this code up here for the product data. Let's say, you know, you're really getting into Python. You know what this code would look like in Python, right? So you could do, um, you could do a Python check on it. So I'm going to go over to the command here and say, um, suggest this code as it would look converted to Python. And let's see what comes up. Oh, there is no code. There we go. I had to highlight it. Now that I've highlighted it, let's see what that actually looks like in Python. So here's my data for my strawberries uh, going through there. It's got my sliced bread and all that, my products uh, using Python syntax. It'll work with Python or Rust or other things. Um, it'll also allow you to take something, for example, from React. So let's say I want to use this React code and I've got a modal yes, no that I wrote in React, and I now want to use this in Angular. I mean, how many times have you like, seen a component you wrote and you found it on the internet, like, that's cool. I want that for Angular. Now I do this, and I can say, I don't have to rewrite it. I can actually just highlight the code, go over to chat, and say, um, convert this code to Angular component. Convert this, and I can even tell it's a React component if I want to. It's helpful to do that. So convert the React component code to Angular component. And hopefully you actually do give it a React one in this case. So first it's going to create a new one. Let's go ahead and see what happens. So I'll just kind of zoom over. So it's creating my Angular yes, no modal. It's got these different emitters. And then it's also going to create the code that actually is in the HTML. And it just got blocked. Boom. That's good. But what actually puts all the code out there for you, and it generates it in Angular. And actually that's exactly what I did to generate a different Angular modal yes, no that I have in my application which is over here, and it generated this code. That's probably why it actually got blocked, because I have code on the, up in the internet for that. But it'll actually help you do this stuff. So you can actually convert languages, you can do frameworks, um, you can convert code from old syntax and new syntax. Like, I do this sometimes for interceptors, where I ask it to convert the class form out of the interceptor to a function form of the interceptor, because that's the new syntax that I'd like to use. So it'll handle all those pieces for you. Uh, other cool stuff, too, is you can ask it stuff like this, which I always like to do, is, um, is React or Angular better? <laughs> it depends on the case. React is flexible and has a larger community. Um, I am standing in front of a bunch of Angular developers. Which is better, <laughs> React or Angular? You should not ask this question. <laughs> it is really, really cranky right now. I feel like it hasn't had its coffee yet, which is kind of fun. So you can actually do some really cool stuff here. Um, before we go into other demos, I want to just explain some other things, too. There's some cool features that you see me use, like a slash command, like explain, clear, fix, things like that. These are common commands you can use. Uh, I really like those. There's some other ones, too. There's, you see the at symbol. So if I go into the... Sorry, do it over here. If I want to clear this out, I can use that. Let's say I want to ask a question about VS Code. I can do VS Code. And the at, this is called a participant or an agent. It's basically giving it better context about what I'm trying to ask. I want to ask it a question about uh, VS Code to say, hey, you know, notice I've got like a black border, a red border, and a yellow border. I'm using my extension called Peacock. So I could ask it things like, uh, what is the Peacock? extension and what does it do for me so then giving it the context it can actually look up in the documentation for it Oop, only programming sorry but you can actually ask a question about vs code like um, 
how do I create new files? Maybe even in VS Code. So it'll search your docs, look it up, and just kind of help you figure out how you actually go through that. So here's the new file command, and when you give it a command it knows, it'll actually put the command right in the window, and it'll actually open it up for you, which is kind of cool. So if you can't find a command, that's another way you can actually go find it. I do this a lot when I don't know where a command is uh, inside of VS Code. The participants are super nice. There's other participants like Workspace. You saw me use that already. Uh, another Workspace command you can do is Workspace slash new. Now what's cool about this is you're combining in a participant with a slash command. The participant is saying, in this workspace, I want you to create a new thing. Watch what happens when I hit new. If I zoom, uh, scroll over, scaffold for a new workspace. I can say something like, uh, create a new express server project. Sure, 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 sure. There you go. Oh my gosh. It is definitely needing some coffee. Let's try this again. Uh, create, let's just actually scaffold new React. Maybe it likes React better because it said that earlier. That is interesting. And there's my file tree. This is called It's Not Happy. And then when it's, basically it'll give you the list and you can create the workspace. It'll actually go create it for you. Notice it's trying to select a folder to put it in. Um, although I can't see what it's actually going to create. In this case, I'm going to refresh VS Code real quick. I'm going to clear, because I actually want to show you this one. Oop, still thinking. There we go. We'll try workspace slash new uh, React project. Yeah, it's just not happy right now. But what's cool about this, it'll actually do this. Um, should have taken a screenshot. It'll create the project for you, give you the file tree. You can actually look at the code. It'll scaffold it up for you and bring it in. I did this earlier to create an express server on my machine, which was super, super helpful. Another thing you do is terminal commands. So you can open up the terminal, and maybe you don't know what to do to build this project. You could say, at terminal, um, how do I build this project? And it'll go ahead and look it up. This is npm run build, which we all know. But what's also nice is not only can I bring it over to my code window, I can say insert into the terminal. So then I can run it in the terminal. There's other features right in the terminal too. So let's say I'm in the terminal here and I run npm runneth the buildeth. And it has no idea what's going on there. You see this little sparkle down here? These little, um, let's see if I can zoom in. Now they disappear since I zoomed in. Let's go back. Let's run it again. There's a little sparkle down here. If I click that, explain this using Copilot. Let's see what's happening. It's probably the wrong command, dude. What you actually wanted to do is run build. So in the terminal, if you type the wrong thing, you're not sure what it is, it'll actually give you hints. We'll go back to chat. Then you can insert the command into the terminal, which I also find super helpful. There's another thing called a chat variable that you can use which I also find good. So you can say something like, um, I don't know, can you suggest improvements uh, to, and then I can use this code variable, this chat variable if I want. Let's do file, and then it makes me pick a file. Let's go ahead and pick package.json on the Angular app. So now it's not a file that's open, but because I told it to go get the context of the file, it's gonna look at it, and it's going to figure out, like, what could I possibly do here? And it's giving some obvious things that I would help with, like versions and outdated. But it doesn't have to just be JSON. It could be TypeScript, JavaScript, or any kind of file uh, that you want to look at. What's cool about this is it allows you to give it additional context about going to find different pieces. Let's flip over to a repo that some of you might meet, use, too. So when you're using GitHub Copilot, if you have Copilot, you'll notice a little icon in the upper right-hand corner that you can go ahead and use. And then a little pop-up chat comes up. In this pop-up chat, I can ask a question. This is Dan Wallin's Angular Architecture repo. So I've enabled it on here. It indexed the repo for me because I'm also an owner of this repo. And I can ask it really cool stuff. So I could say, you know, um, where is the file with the behavior subject? Just whatever's on the top of my head. So I know there's a couple demos in there for it. And you can use Copilot on the repo to actually search things right in the browser where it'll figure out what those are. 
You can ask it questions about what's happening in this code. You can um, use it for pull requests. You can see down here, there's a couple. So I can click on one, and it'll probably bring me to that file right here. Then I can ask it more questions about the code. And let's say I wanted to use Copilot inline. Notice there's a little Copilot right here inside the file. And I could ask it, uh, what is this file doing? Just like I did inside of VS Code. So you can use Copilot right in the browser. It's not only limited to using it inside your editor. Let's say you're inside VS Code. My, my feature of the month is this. Let's say I've got all these changes I just made. And in fact, I'm going to undo a lot of them. Let's see here. Let's actually undo everything. And let's go ahead back to product data. And I'm going to change this from 10 to 10,000. I should now have a git change. Who here likes typing git com comments? That same guy? No, you're just next to him. OK. I don't like him. You know what my git comments say a lot? Foo. I did work. Things like that. Now if I click on these three little sparkles, oh, cool. No more writing Git comments. I can just press a button. And I've got to tell you, this one's been really good for me. I'd say nine out of 10 times, if not more, it actually has a better comment than I could ever possibly write, which is super cool. And if you do multiple files, it'll actually do that. When I was upgrading all the Angular projects, it was writing really good comments about the things that I was changing in those files. And then I can uncomment and move further. You can also do stuff with pull requests and other features as well. But I want to go back to VS Code, because here's another cool feature that you can do. Let's say you're inside of a file. Let's say uh, we'll go back to the product service, and I want to explain what this update is doing. Now, you've seen me use the chat, but let's say I can't type. You see this little microphone down here? I can start the voice chat. Or I can hit Command-I and say, explain this code for me, please. And now I've got voice text going into the tool to do this explain for me. You can use any command that you can use voice to do that. And it's not just limited to the chat. You could actually go over here. I'll select something else. And I do the Command-I here. And then I can hold down Command. Oops. Wrong command, John. Command-I. And I can hit this little microphone. And it pops it back over there. And now I can just start talking to you like it's listening to me. And I don't know what it's going to do with this information that I'm typing in. <laughs> kind of curious what it'll do there. It seems like you're testing the system where you accidentally left your microphone on. <laughs> Why, yes, Copilot, I did. Uh, and not to be outdone, there's a cool feature which you have to kind of look up. Oh, gosh, what's it called? Uh, voice keyword activation. I'm going to turn this on for chat and view. And now when I say something like, hey, code, tell me how many people in the world use Angular. I didn't have to touch anything. And it's got a one second delay at the end. And of course, it's not going to answer that information for me. But I could do something, uh, anything I want. I mean, I can walk away from the keyboard now. And I could say, hey, code, can you suggest some code to create a behavior subject for me? And it didn't hear me. Hey, code, can you suggest code to create a behavior subject? And let's see what it does. And there you go. Uh, I keep this off by default because when I left it on, people I'd be on a Zoom call or Teams call with at work would just start talking to my editor and asking it to do things um, because that's the people I work with. But it is a lot of fun to play with. There's also another mode called walkie-talkie mode. Walkie-talkie mode is effectively when you're in code anywhere and you hold the command I down, it automatically will open up the voice chat so you can see that it's listening to me. And when I let go of command I, it stops listening. So that's a property and a feature you can use. I do like that because I actually have to do something to make it happen. But it's kind of cool when you're like, you know, I, I know what I want, but if I type that, like you saw me struggling typing at times and spelling. Spelling's hard. Command I will help me just kind of get the words out. And then I can edit what I want before I actually submit that command. All right, last bits. There's so much more coming. It's actually fascinating what you can do with the tool and make you better with it. We looked at chat today. I didn't even touch the docs mutations coming. I didn't touch the pull request features. Automatic 
code reviews done by AI with GitHub Copilot inside your browser or VS Code. CLI has these features as well for Copilot. So maybe you want to do stuff like writing code. Right now, generally available is Copilot with everything I showed you. But you can also change your conversations. This is in public beta right now for some of the features I showed. The CLI also is in private beta. So the CLI for GitHub will let you do this. You can also do pull requests or automatic code reviews. This is in a private beta. I can't show you yet today, but it is coming. Something that's really cool. You can sign up for all these betas right on the GitHub Copilot website. Uh, you can search your documentation. This is fascinating. Imagine being able to point it at the Angular docs and tell it just with that context, help me understand how to do whatever the new feature is. And it can actually go find it for you. Customized with the fine tuning of your documentation. So you can fine tune it with your own custom models too. This is an alpha. It's not even available to me to use yet, um, which I like. There's cool stuff coming where you can make your own model. Imagine you've got internal private usage and you want to point at something specific and you want to fine tune it. You'll be able to do that. You can also point it with the uh, GitHub Copilot Enterprise just at your internal repos and all the stuff that you have stays within your context of your company. Uh, and so it's not used anywhere else. Um, which in the privacy and the PII is always kept away from the cloud, by the way. But when you get enterprise license, you get more features. Uh, you also get more access to uh, fine-tuning your specific repos. But to leave you with a couple tips, these are the five that I wanted to call out. First, participants and agents are super cool for giving you context. The chat variables are really nice because you can say, hey, suggest for improvements to this file if you want. Slash commands, you get things like fix or new or clear. Um, there's more coming. And then my two favorite keystrokes are command I for the inline chat. And if you hold that one, it does the voice for you. That's the walkie talkie mode. And command control I will open it up in chat window. So with all that, just want to let you all know that um, this is not perfect, right? It's AI. For me, AI isn't about how we're going to replace us or what's going to come down the road with new features and stuff. For me, it's about how you make my life better today. What can I do now with AI? And this is why I've been loving using Copilot to actually do a lot of the work for me. And if you use this, you'd be a much more efficient developer overall. Will there be hiccups along the way? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, that's the whole point of it. But I do trust that this stuff's going to get better and better. And every time I get this demo, I get a different uh, ultimate response. And I'm going to leave you with one last thought. I mentioned I go to colleges a lot. And when I go to colleges, I often see interesting code. And one of these interesting pieces of code I saw was this cool website where they do a lottery. So this is in a math textbook for computer science students at a university in the US. And they're doing this thing where they actually run this code to say, hey, if you invested you know, $200, tell me how many times you might win the lottery, which is kind of depressing, by the way. You know, so it shows you don't do that. And then I grabbed the code from it, and I brought it over to a window. So let's see where that code is. It's probably near the project. This is from my daughter's university. This made me cry a little inside. And my daughter was interning uh, for her professor, and she was tasked with refactoring this code. And she's like, I've been putting this one off. I don't know what is happening here. And I don't know if they ran out of letters or what at some point. I mean, look at this. The insanity of going on. Now, I looked at the code. And I, I came in literally and did a talk for this university and I said, hey, do you mind if I bring this up real quick? And the professor's like, sure, you can use it. And I said, let me just see what Copilot makes of this. And when I ran Copilot through it, and just to, for the brevity of time here, I'll show you two things that it came up with. So it ran through the code, it's just a Google Doc, and the first thing it did is, trying to go to the top of the code, and it refactored it, is it actually took the code and created constants or prize tiers and things and gave variable names like total prize, outcomes, number of tickets, etc. I ran it a second time, by the way, and I asked it to do it again. And when it did that, you go to the bottom. Let's see here. Yeah, so now you'll notice it's got like win counts and win amounts, handle large wins as a function. It actually broke out these different sizes. My favorite part was the variable names. I love how it ran out of small names. It's like large, medium, small, tiny, micro, nano, pico, losing. I'm like, yeah. 
Losing, wonderful. And then what I did is I copied this code, and for brevity, I went over, and you can see this in the console. I actually pasted the code into the function, and I put that in there, and now it's like jackpot, losing Pico, et cetera, just to replace the code live, and everything still worked. So I showed them live how in like five seconds I could refactor the whole page, and the professor's like, this is great, and the interns, like my daughter getting paid for it, were like, go away. <laughs> <laughs> So just wanted to show you a live thing. You can do this stuff. Not all of it is scripted. And I just want to say thank you all for coming. And I hope to answer questions for you later.